Um, so hi, my name is uh, Marlene Kretschmer. I'm a postdoc at the University of Reading, and I will talk about causal inference and causal discovery in the context of teleconnections. And first, I'd like um, to acknowledge my co-authors, Ted Shepard, Elena Sajodo from Reading, Giuseppe Zappa now in Bologna, as well as Alberto Arribas, Rachel Pradden, and I Robinson and Stan Adams, all from the Mac Office Informatics Lab. So what um, motivates this work is that um, an improved understanding, as we have also seen in the previous talk, of teleconnections is key to reduce uncertainties about regional weather and climate predictions. And so um, typical questions posed in this context are, for example, how much does ENSO contribute to temperature variability in region A or which processes drive precipitation in region B? So the, um, the task or the, the challenge I'm addressing here is um, kind of extracting these causal information from data. Mm -hmm. Machine learning and in particular deep learning are of course extremely powerful to classify spatial temporal patterns, but they are not necessarily designed um, to improve um, process, uh, sorry, to improve process understanding or kind of to answer these causal questions. So um, at least in the context um, of teleconnections, I here also argue for an approach which is embedded in the mathematical concept of causality. And so in the first talk of my first part of my talk, I will um, talk about causal inference and how we can use it to quantify cause effects from data. And then in the second part, I will talk about causal discovery, which is more on this intersection with machine learning and um, will kind of briefly discuss how this can be used to learn causal structures from data. Okay, <clears throat> so um, causal inferences is what one could also call knowledge-guided statistic. And so very simply speaking, it sets the, um, it sets the rules of when we can actually like when we can actually quantify cause effects from data. What is required and what is actually the first step of any cause inference analysis is um, using our knowledge to set a plausible causal model. And this is usually shown in the form of a network. So again, here you can think of these uh, nodes ABC as um, processes describing something like ENSO or precipitation, etc. And so this uh, network encodes um, all our domain knowledge and our assumptions of the underlying processes which generated the data. And explicitly outlining these assumptions first has then the advantage that we can draw some logical implications from this model and test if they're supported by the data. In this example, um, D and B, uh, we would expect them to be correlated or to be statistically associated because they're both driven by process A. But once we control for A, we would expect them to be independent. If they're not, then our assumptions must um, be wrong. And then further, we can use um, cause inference rules or kind of graph rules to estimate the causal effects. And um, it's again, it's always based on this model and it's basically about blocking the, um, the influence of other nodes which might um, affect um, the link we are interested in estimating in. So for example, if we want to estimate the cause and effect from A to B, we do need to control for this common drive effect C. Um, to give some intuition of yeah, how we can um, some, com how we can combine scientific theory with data analysis. Um, I prepared some uh, yeah very simple real data examples. So in this case, we I have data of precipitation in Denmark and the Mediterranean in summer, and the data here is n separate analysis data, and all time series have been standardized. Um, there's actually quite a strong um, statistical association um, between them. And for example, if we would assume some linear dependence and we would regress Denmark precipitation on Mediterranean precipitation, we would find a significant regression coefficient of minus, point, uh, zero, uh, minus 0 0.25. But, um, well, of course, as climate scientists, we wouldn't interpret this causally because we uh, know from different lines of evidence that both um, regions or precipitation, both regions is driven or is affected by the position of the North Atlantic storm track. Um, for example, um, calculated or expressed by the North Atlantic Oscillation Index. And so we can, again, we can test this, um, or we can test our knowledge with the data. And in the linear case, um, kind of controlling for the common driver, in this case, NAO, actually just means including it our, in our regression model. 
and you see if we include the NIO, then actually this um, this regression coefficient drops to zero. Um, so the kind of data generating model we had intuitively in mind um, can fully explain the statistical association we, we saw between the electrification of the Mediterranean. And this, this strong correlation really just comes from this causal effect the NAO has on both regions. Um, this is another example, um, but in one in which controlling for a different process is actually harmful. So this network summarizes um, a large body of literature of how ENSO affects precipitation in California in winter um, via the jet stream. So um, if we were to, or if we wanted to estimate the effect of ENSO on California precipitation, and if we would put both ENSO and the jet in our regression model, so this is, I think, something uh, we actually do in, in climate science, um, just putting everything in, then um, we would actually get a regression coefficient for ENSO, which is zero. Um, this, of course, makes no sense, but what happened here is that um, since the cause effect of ENSO is completely mediated by a, uh, by a jet or by the jet stream, we basically regressed out the effect we wanted to measure. So the correct way, again, assuming this model, uh, assuming we agree on this model, would be just to um, regress California precipitation on ENSO directly without um, controlling for anything here. We could also... Um, Kind of estimate these two um, links separately um, and first estimate the effect of ENSO on the jet and then of jet on California precipitation. And then um, the product along this, um, this path um, is actually the same as estimating the, the, um, the impact of ENSO directly. Um, this is a third example. Um, again, it includes ENSO and its effect on the jet stream, but this time on the southern hemisphere. And we have this. Um, the direct pathway from ENSO to the jet, but there's also an influence of ENSO on the polar vortex in the stratosphere, so and which, which then again affects the jet stream. So we kind of have ENSO affecting the jet um, via the so-called tropospheric pathway and then via the stratospheric pathway. Um, if we are interested in the total effect, again, this could be done quite easily because there are like no confounding factors in this model, and we would estimate this effect of 0.18. But if we wanted to, um, um, if we were interested in kind of the contribution from the different pathways, we could also calculate this. And so for the tropospheric pathway, we do have to block this um, flow of information by the vortex. So we have to include the vortex in our, um, in our model, in our regression model. And then we see that the effect of, um, of ENSO drops to only 0 0.05. And then for the stratospheric pathway, we could first quite easily estimate the effect of ENSO on the vortex. There again, there are no confounding factors here. But when estimating the effect of the vortex on the jet, we do have to um, control for the effect of ENSO, which is a common driver in this case. And then the stratospheric pathway is again this product uh, of these two links. And if we would uh, sum up um, the stratospheric pathway with the tropospheric pathway, then you see that it um, exactly adds up to the total effect. So these previous examples were quite uh, quite simple and also show processes which are already well understood. But of course, the situation can be more complicated um, as for example, in this case, this is from a paper which is currently under discussion at Weather and Climate Dynamics. And in this paper, we um, we try to address the role of Arctic sea ice loss or in the sea, ice, uh, sea region um, and what this plays for future polar vortex changes. And this is actually quite a controversial topic. So um, what we do here, what we did here is um, as a first step, we really to kind of um, try, we try to summarize all the previous work on this, on this topic and kind of included all, this, um, all these findings in kind of a plausible um, model of the, um, um, of the involved processes. Uh, here shown in the form again of a network. And uh, you can see, well, things are a bit messy now, and I won't go into detail, but you can see there are several mechanisms involved and or likely involved. And also we see the self loops, which in this case represent strong autocorrelation on the sub-seasonal time scale. Um, but again, based on this as, um, on, based on this model and um, making a few choices on the data and time scales, we could then actually, or we tried to estimate this, this causal effect 
but again, by controlling on the uh, potential controlling factors. And we do this here for the different CMO5 models. And the, the key point here is that um, by setting or by outlining our um, assumptions first, we can have a more um, reliable and a more plausible estimate of the, of the causal effect. Um, okay, so um, in the second part, I will now briefly talk about causal discovery. Um, because I guess, well, <laughs> a typical criticism of cause inference is that, um, that it's, it's very nice, but of course we need, need this causal model, but what if we don't have this model? And this is, um, yeah, this task is sometimes called causal discovery. So what we have here as kind of input data is time series, um, again, of just the processes re representing different, um, um, different, sorry, uh, different time series representing different processes we're interested in. And what we want is to um, find or to learn the causal structure of these different processes. Um, there are some things called causal discovery algorithms to achieve this. And um, Libby also mentioned this, also in that did quite a lot of work on this. Um, I've been involved in something called the, um, the PCMCI algorithm. Um, there are a few bit more assumptions in it, but um, the, the basic idea is that you can test if process A influences B or as a causal effect by um, iterating through different combinations of conditions from the input data in kind of an optimized way. In this way, you could, or you try to filter out all the non causal spurious correlations you find and come up with this causal structure. Um, it has this, or this PCMCI algorithm has been particularly designed um, for climate data and kind of can deal with um, typical things like strong auto correction, for example. Also, there have been recent advances, advancements uh, of this algorithm, for example, um, with Elena Patron, we have a paper recently under review where we combine this algorithm with a mark switching algorithm and um, to make it also um, capable to deal with um, non-stationary causal effects, for example, in the presence of some kind of persistent background regime. And also, um, it can now deal with instantaneous links and uh, much more. And I suggest to follow the work by um, Jakob Brunner on this topic. But we um, can also go a step further and um, pose uh, and uh, address the situation when we don't even have time series. Um, but all we have is our printed climate data um, from observations or climate models, for example. So we want, um, from the credit climate data, we want to extract um, time series, which we then put in our causal discovery algorithm. And this is, of course, the well, pretty much an optimal situation for, for machine learning, kind of to find these spatial temporal patterns to get from gridded data to time series. And um, for the case when we not interested in the full causal structure, but more like um, um, finding some causal drivers of some process C, we, um, in the 2018 paper, we propose one very basic um, cluster approach of how we can first find these um, yeah, strongly correlated, likely relevant regions, and then extract the causal drivers of these. Um, we have some recent papers where we apply these tools, uh, for example, um, on the Indian summer monsoon, or to predict Atlantic hurricanes, uh, hurricane activity on the crop yield. And uh, I don't have time to talk about these in detail, but um, the key point here is that um, even it is um, a machine learning approach, so we start from related climate data and want to predict some target variable, um, they all need uh, a lot of domain knowledge. And I think in the climate case, um, it's, I think especially the, um, the time scale is really um, difficult to address or challenging to address because it's a fully coupled system and several different um, relevant timescales. So um, yeah, again, I think it's, it's impossible without the domain knowledge. So this is my, uh, my conclusion slide. Um, so the point I try to make is that I think that in climate science, the, we are, um, the, like, the physical concept of cause and effect is very natural to us, but yet we don't really capitalize on the mathematical um, formalism of this concept. But um, I think like including our cause and knowledge and all the knowledge we have already on the system is really essential um, for to well, it's essential to include this in our data analysis to also 
answer these causal questions which we pose. Um, I also think that kind of combined with causal discovery algorithms, we can also, or these tools can also help to close knowledge gaps. Um, for example, when it's, um, when it's about the different direction of uh, causal interaction, which we are not aware of maybe. And then finally, I think that especially at this uh, intersection with deep learning, which is, um, I think, well, which is of course some um, yeah, ongoing research activities, but I think the overlap is not uh, large enough yet. So I really think that combining these ideas and tools with deep learning, but also expanded AI is extremely promising. And well, I wanted to um, kind of end with a very optimistic statement. Um, so I think it's really an exciting time to um, do causal guided machine learning, as there's really like a lot left to do both from the application and the method set. So thank you. Thank you very much. Great presentations. Um, so we have a lot of questions actually right now on Slido and we still have eight minutes left before the break. So I thought maybe we can take a few questions here for Marlene. Uh, one question is, Marlene, can you identify a hidden connection due to an unknown factor if you draw a map like this and include one or more unknowns? Um, so it's definitely possible also to kind of explicitly include unobservables in your network and in your assumptions. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you like of, um, the person asking the question referred to the causal discovery part or the causal inference part, but I think for both it's possible, but again, um, depending on assumptions on the data. Thank you. Another question. Can you identify a hidden connection due to an unknown factor if you, no, sorry. Um, <laughs> in experimental ecology, we would sometimes manipulate a system to identify a causal relationship. Is there an analog in your causal work? Um, I think it's exactly what is meant by, by a causal effect. It's not the association between X and Y, which we can perfectly measure, but it's like, what if we intervene in the system? And the causal inference is about kind of um, predicting this an intervention, but only based on the available data of the observed data we have. And again, like mathematically, this is um, possible or shown to be possible if you have a causal model. So this is um, the um, well, main assumption. Um, and of course, well, in, let's say in, in science, it's a bit more tricky than that because we have usually some more complex systems. And again, like I said, in climate, we have different timescales, et cetera. But um, yes, so mathematically it's possible if you have a causal model. Okay. Our examples one, two, and three, based on multivariate time series. If so, did you treat them as IID in order to get this thought relationship? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand the first part of the question. So the question is, in your examples, number one, two, and three, um, these are multivariate time series, right? And if so, do you treat them as IID? Yeah, well, in this case, um, well, we used seasonal mean data to exactly um, kind of, um, yeah, not think about at least at um, of autocorrelation, but I guess um, it's true. One could question the causal model and say, um, well, what about more kind of, I don't know, decadal variability, etc. cetera. Um, but I think this is again the deal, like we make the assumptions um, explicit and then we can discuss or we can um, interpret results based on these assumptions. But it's also um, completely fine to kind of challenge the assumptions and make better ones. Okay, one more question for Marlene and Kirsten, if it's okay with you. Uh, here's one more question that I think you could answer. But I first ask this question here to Marlene. How do you account for possible false discoveries given that there's so many possibilities? Um, so in the cause of discovery, um, part, there are different ways. Um, I guess the basic idea is that you have some kind of significance thresholds or significance levels there. And then you can have, well, you have multiple testing involved, but you can then also apply false discovery rate, um, false discovery rate corrections on your, on your tests. And this way we actually, uh, we showed this in the science advances paper that you can then control your false discovery rate to the, um, to the before set uh, significance level of, I don't know, 5% or so. And this is of course, especially relevant in a high dimensional setup. Great, thank you. So we'll take more questions on for you also in the panel session at the end. So here's a question, Kirsten, that relates to LRP that I was hoping that maybe you would be willing to answer. 
for NLP, does the spatial arrangement of hotspots in the heat map or the time series matter as well as the actual values in aligning images to years? Oh, I think that's a, probably a question to Libby though. Sorry. But I know I think that can be rephrased as just, you know, does the spatial arrangements of the hotspots as well as their val values matter in the prediction? So does it matter, I guess, where your blobs in the tropics are? Is that, that's how I'm interpreting the question. Um, in, instead of predicting the years, in predicting the North Atlantic storms. Yeah, the, the location of the blobs are really important. And um, we, we were specifically looking for the MJO and we knew that there was spatial um, dependence in the tropics in terms of the structure. And so we, we also used um, a lasso regression in order to account for this. But yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. And I think, I think the important point is here that at least in, in your example, I believe, and at least in my example in terms of the years from the question, that the spatial arrangement is everything because that's the process, that's the mechanism. It doesn't just matter if there's a blob somewhere. We, it really, to tie it back to the physics, it matters where that blob is. Um, whether it's a specific process like the Madden Julian oscillation, or in my examples, it could be the fact that the land heats faster than the ocean. So it's very, we actually see the network pick up on the difference in heating or warming between the land versus the ocean. And that's how we can bring it back to, again, to physics. So. All right, here's Great. one more question. Oh. One more question that I thought I could throw out for Libby and Kirsten. Uh, is it possible to have a measure of uncertainty on the red spots from the heat map being good predictors? Yeah, so I mentioned that there's um, recent work on uh, LRP uncertainty by the LRP group, but you can also just train a bunch of models and see what their LRP looks like. And we did that and we found that they generally look the same in terms of what it was outputting. So that's how you can, uh, one way you can look at uncertainty. All right, thank you. I think with that, it's time to take an early break, two minutes early. And we will meet again in 22 minutes at right on the hour. So thank you, everybody.